Well, good morning, Calvary Presbyterian Church. It is good to be back here with you. It's always, it's always a pleasure. I, was, uh, I think this is, I was telling my wife, Naveen, who's here with me, uh, that this is my sixth time. I've, actually, I preached here four times previously. I was here on one other occasion. So this has now become sort of a, a familiar place to me, which I'm really glad is the case. So during the summer, people go to the shore, but you guys are the shore. And so you're where everybody wants to be during these uh, summer months. So again, as was mentioned, uh, I serve with an organization, a ministry of our denomination called Ministry to State. It is a ministry to those who serve in government. And I'm the New Jersey State Capital Minister. Uh, and so last time I was here, I believe, was during the fall of last year. And I was talking about that there was going to be uh, the Ministry of Angel Tree, which brings Christmas gifts to uh, children of those who are in prison. You put ornaments on a tree, and you grab an ornament representing a child, and you buy a gift for the child. Um, and so uh, that came to fruition, thanks be to God. Our, our uh, state house uh, Christmas tree became an angel tree, and it was well received within our government and their full participation. All the kids got gifts. And out of that, I had a chance to actually do the invocation uh, at the assembly immediately before, before Christmas. And so, believe it or not, Christmas is approaching again. I have my first conversation regarding that just uh, this past Friday. Uh, and so we're looking to maybe include 50 children this year. And so I may want to enlist some help to, in order to bring that together. So look for uh, the newsletter um, if you're on that mailing list. And if you're not on the mailing list, there's an opportunity to uh, sign up. And there's literature on the, the table in, in the foyer. Uh, more recently, one initiative that I'm going to ask you to pray for, um, I reached out to, the Lord has been gracious to connect me to about 50 to 60 members and staff to develop personal relationship, have their cell phone contact and so on. So I reached out to a number of them to begin to meet remotely for uh, 30 minutes every other week for a time of scripture and prayer. Um, so initially, I just got some, you know, emoji replies, which I'm grateful for, some hearts and some lift, you know, some prayer. But, but nobody said yes. I'm like, well, that's nice. But, if, but, but ultimately, I did get three affirmative responses just from that initial inquiry. Um, and one of those is going to be beginning tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, so please be in prayer that people be receptive and those would be uh, fruitful. Anyways, obviously, as you can imagine, I could go on and on, but I won't belabor. I won't, I won't take up more of your time in that regard. I'd love to talk to you more after the service if you're interested in hearing more about this ministry. So let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for Calvary Presbyterian Church. I thank you for this faithful body of believers in your name that seek to be faithful to you, Lord Jesus Christ, to proclaim your name, to, to live together for your name's sake, to love one another, to love you, uh, to be witnesses, to be light. So may your grace shine upon them and may you bless them in, in, in their doing good until that day they see you face to face. And now, Lord, we do pray that you would open up our hearts to receive the word of truth, the word of life, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. May our hearts be meek, may they be receptive, may they be humble, may they be attentive, may they be renewed in your image and likeness because we, you have addressed us and we have listened and obeyed and believed. This we pray in your name, Lord Jesus, and in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So our scripture reading this morning is Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to, to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces 
gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, backpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, backpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and, and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was, was urgent, and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. What a story, huh? All right, so... So one of the great challenges, I think it's fair to say, uh, that we face is how we live as Christians in a society that is increasingly at odds with Christian beliefs and convictions. Now, the scriptures tell us 
that we are aliens, that we are exiles right here where we live, that our citizenship is in fact elsewhere. It is in heaven. We have a heavenly citizenship. We belong first and foremost to the holy nation of God's holy people. That means even when our society thinks that we're weird or becomes hostile or rejects us even, that doesn't leave us without a home, without a citizenship, without a nation. We are, through Christ, our king, members of God's kingdom and God's household. You belong, you who believe, belong to the eternal kingdom into which everyone is invited, into which everyone is is called to enter. But that still leaves us with a question as to how to live in the time and place where God has, in fact, placed us. And that, I think it's fair to say, can be challenging. It requires wisdom. It requires knowing what you believe. It requires prayer and communion with God. And it requires mutual encouragement and prayer for one another. Now, a particular guide that offers wisdom as to how to live as God's people among those who are not God's people, how to live within the kingdom of God among the kingdoms of this world is the book of Daniel. Um, When Daniel contains some of the favorite stories that, that we may know even from the time that we are children. So what's the setting for Daniel? The setting around 600 BC is that of exile. Uh, Judah and its capital city, Jerusalem, have been conquered by the Babylonians, the kingdom that is conquering that region of the world at that time. They're sort of taking over the entire neighborhood. It's a big neighborhood. And Daniel and his friends are among a group of Jewish exiles who have been brought to Babylon to be formed in the way of Babylon. Right? The goal is to Babylonize them. I know that may not be a verb, but we can use it that way. We talk about Americanizing. Well, here's Babylonizing. And what we see in Daniel is how to live as God's people among those who are not God's people. People who think differently and live differently and who expect that within their society, everyone everyone will conform to their way of thinking and their way of life. And Babylon is ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar, who is obviously a central figure in our passage this morning. He is the most powerful man in that part of the world at that time. That's who they're kind of confronting. And so we'll look at our, our, our passage in four headings or points. One, the temptation of false worship. Two, the demand of false worship. Three, resisting false worship. And four, the one worthy of our worship. Okay, so first, the temptation of false worship. So our chapter begins with Nebuchadnezzar making a golden statue that is about 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And I think based on its dimensions, as well as other clues in the text itself, it's unlikely that it's a statue of the king himself. I think it's probably a, a, a statue of one of the gods or a representation of the gods of Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar gathers everyone of importance and rank in Babylon to come to the dedication of this statue. It's very clear this is something very important to him. So a command goes out to nations and peoples of every language, all the peoples, that when they hear the sound of the music, they are to fall down and worship the golden image. So again, verse 7. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So think about this setting and really how overwhelming and irresistible it is. There's no divided government. There's no dissent. There's no disagreement. Everyone who's in a position of authority is doing this. And then there's the music to get you fired up to get you going, right? Let's all go down before the golden image. All your friends are doing it. All your neighbors are doing it. The entire city is doing this. Everyone lives this way. Everyone does it. And if everyone does it, then how can it be wrong, right? How can, are all these people, how can, I mean, how, how can it be wrong? You just do what everyone else does. Just be a normal person, man. Just don't be a weirdo. Just go do the thing. That's fine. Don't be uptight. And when you're in a situation like that, 
It's very hard to see that there's any other way to be. It's like asking a fish if it's wet. What are you talking about with the sweat? I'm just here. I don't know about wet. So that raises a question for us to consider. What is it that you might be participating in that's just the way everyone else lives, but is in fact you're bound before an idol? What is it that you might be immersed in that you don't even know that you're wet? What are you bowing to? What are you worshiping that is not God? Now, that can be a question to bring before the Lord in prayer and to the light of the Scriptures. It can be a question to bring to others who are close to you, who are walking in Christ with you. Do you have a brother and sister in your life who can tell you that you are bowing to an idol? If you don't have such a person, it's imperative that you have such a relationship. You must have people in your life, at least one person, who will risk angering you because they love you. Because when you and I are told, or even have it implied, that we're worshiping an idol, our instinctive response is probably to get mad. <laughs> I know I know, like I'm not. Right? Now it's possible, as kind of I've already suggested, that because we, live in, we all live in the same time and place, that in certain situations, there's no one around who can identify the idol because we're all immersed. We're all grooving to the music, man, you know? And this, so this is where knowing your church history and looking to what the church thought has, and has believed in times past can be helpful. If all Christians or all the overwhelming number of Christians believe certain things up until, I don't know, 1968 or something, then it's likely the case that we who have, are changing have it wrong that we are, in fact, idol worshipers in some way, shape, or form. And this is where it can be a great resource to belong to a church like this one that has a confession of faith and catechisms that go back hundreds of years to give you a perspective on our times from outside of our times. Now, ultimately, though, in order for you to not bow before false gods, then you must know and draw near the living God. It's really the only way. You may have heard this, but how, do, how, how can you identify a counterfeit? How do you know a counterfeit when you see it? Well, there are an infinite number of possible counterfeits. You literally cannot know them all. The only way to know a counterfeit when you see it is to be really familiar and to know the real thing, the original. So that when a counterfeit emerges, you can identify it because you, you are so intimately knowledgeable and familiar with what the original looks like. You know the real God. You've drawn near to him. You are familiar with him. You know his word. It lives with and percolates within your heart. There are idols that are constantly beckoning to us. Come to me and you will be satisfied. You will be fulfilled. What your mom said when you were little, it's true. Like if everyone was going to, you know, jumping off, I don't know, they have George Washington Bridge, would you do it too? Don't ever do anything because everyone else is doing it. Even if the music is loud and energizing and all your friends are into it and the crowd is roaring, it's delight and it's approval. Because God has something better. He's the real one. Don't bow to idols. Now, in this case, not only was there a summons for all to bow, but there was also this in verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Which brings us to our second point, the demand of false worship. So apparently, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't big into freedom of religion. That wasn't his thing. There was no First Amendment in 6th century B.C. Babylon. Now, it's interesting, guys. So if someone tells you to do something because it's great and everyone's a part of it, you might be inclined to go along. But if he, if it's, if he says, you better do this or else, you're like, wait a second. Why do you have to make people do this? Now you get suspicious. This is so awesome, right? But Nebuchadnezzar, he really wasn't concerned about any of that. What he wanted was loyalty, allegiance, compliance. 
you bow. Here are your choices. You bow or you die a horrible, painful death. And there is no door number three. So what are you going to do? Well, some were non-compliant. This is verse 12 again. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So these uh, men are Daniel's friends who we are introduced to in Daniel chapter 1, these, these Jews who were called Jews in our verse. We know from chapter 1 that these young men were at the top of their class without compromising their integrity. They held fast to their convictions, and yet they excelled at the same time. And at the end of chapter 2, immediately before our reading this morning, we learned they were appointed as administrators over the province of Babylon. So these are men of high rank. And it seems that jealousy, at least, could have been part of what motivated, uh, you know, sort of their, this accusation. So the king is told, these guys you put in charge, they don't care about you or what you have to say about your gods, O king. So accordingly, Nebuchadnezzar is furious. He is incited as they hoped he would be. But he wants to give the offenders another chance because he likes and respects them. It's apparent that he does. These are not rebels. They are not troublemakers. These are not people who just want to break stuff. Right? These are men of character who've served the king well. So Nebuchadnezzar appealed to them. See how kind he is to do so. So we read again in verses 14 to 15. Nebuchadnezzar answered them and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready... When you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the, the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So he gives them the opportunity to worship, to obey, or to the fire. And what does he say? And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand. The, the assumption of any kind of pressure, whether it's social, mental, physical, legal, is the pain or the loss that you experience is ultimate. That there's nothing above the pain, there's no one above the pain or loss that's worth going through the pain or loss for. There's nothing, there's no one to help you actually. You're on your own. When your workplace demands that you affirm and speak falsehoods which reject, which reject the truth and re reality of God's creation, what choice do you have but to comply? For who is the God who can deliver you? The fact is this, we can profess faith, but really in our hearts we might think, who is the God who can deliver me? I must do anything to avoid this pain, to avoid this consequence which is ultimate. If this were to happen, then what? So we are tempted to yield and maybe, in fact, do yield. Nebuchadnezzar is claiming, his claim here, he's saying his hands have ultimate power to save and to destroy, to preserve life or to take life. These are godlike powers that he is claiming for himself. And in moments of weakness or confusion or spiritual coldness or dryness, Maybe you can ascribe ultimate power to what threatens you and not believe there's anyone who can deliver you. You agree and say, who is the God who can deliver me out of the hands of this demise that I am facing? What choice do I have but to go along? How will they respond? Chapter, um, excuse me, point three, brings us to point three, resisting false worship. So let's read again verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Are you fired up? I'm fired up. This is inspiring. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, you do not have ultimate power to save or destroy. You do not have power over life and death. This is holy defiance. Now, 
it's important to note here that these men have everything to lose. They are at the top. And when you're at the top, not only does that have its own value, I mean, we like being, being at the top is a good thing. We want to, it has its own value, but, but your life is organized around staying at the top. Your entire life is built now around this position of rank or this great achievement or success that you've arrived to, that I've, you know, whatever the case may be. So that if you, so that if you don't remain there, your whole life can fall apart because your life, again, is, is built around this reality of the success that you have arrived at. But they understand what's at stake. If they bow, they'd be agreeing with Nebuchadnezzar's claim. Whatever you bow to, you're saying to it that it has ultimate power and authority, that it has power of life and death. They say to him, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us out of your hand. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Who is your refuge, ultimately? Who is your strength? No other God you serve can deliver you, my friends. If you bow before anything or anyone but the living God in order to be saved, you are bound before that which cannot save you. If you bow before anyone or anything other than the living God, in order to be saved, you are bound before that which cannot save. Listen to the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen to again, again to some of the most inspiring words that have ever been spoken. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Our God can deliver us, and he will deliver us. And if that deliverance includes the fire, is through the fire, then so be it. But we will not bow before any other god. Let that sink into your souls and saturate your hearts and become active in your lives. But if not, does your faith include, but if not? So one month ago, the New Jersey Senate passed a bill that includes a provision arguably requiring physicians and healthcare professionals to provide abortions. I have to be honest with you at this point. I actually don't think that provision rises to such a level, makes it mandatory. But others of longer experience than me in this matter, in these matters, think otherwise. They believe that it does impose a mandate. Now, the fact is, the law, the, the law is not yet in its final form, and there's still some things to work out, so we don't know what it's going to happen finally. Something is going to pass. But assuming it becomes law and is mandatory, what will you do? Now, right now, at this point, I will be addressing medical professionals in particular, but you can apply this more broadly to yourself, um, you know, as, as, you, as is fitting for whatever your field or endeavor may be. So let's kind of break it down. The God we serve is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us, right? So first, you may never be faced with such a decision of being asked to participate in an elective abortion. That's just probably the most likely outcome. Secondly, or if you are faced and you simply decline, I choose not to participate in this procedure, respectfully, your request is respected and no more is made out of it. You, you honored and trust the Lord, trusted the Lord. You didn't violate your conscience. You did not bow out of fear. And the situation resolves in peace. Thanks be to God. That is a good outcome. That is a good result. And something, by the way, just to keep in mind, if something like that should arise. When you resist, you don't only create a problem or a potential problem for yourself, but also for the other party involved. They have to decide whether they want to make an issue out of your declining to participate in something that's important to you as a matter of conscience. The fact is most people don't want trouble. And it's easier for them not to escalate or make an issue about something that's important to you, especially if they value you, right? 
literally people don't want to make federal cases out of things, right? And in this case, that's a possibility, right? So I just want you to be mindful of that, right? You just, you just move forward and, and understand that the Lord is at work over the whole situation. So those two outcomes are most likely. One, nothing happens. Two, res it resolves peacefully. But what about, but if not? You need to be prepared for that contingency and not yield. You're not bowing to God dishonoring unjust demands or lies is not simply based on a relief that avoids the distress that there's never a point where there's ultimately a clash. It's, but if not, I will not bow. When you do that, you enter into God's power and purpose that the deliverance, whether immediate or otherwise, will come in whatever way the Lord chooses as you trust in him. Resolve this now and ask the Lord to strengthen you to be prepared should that time come. Now, this situation, the situation in which you find yourself dealing with, but if not, might not be one of external coercion or pressure, but simply a highly distressing situation in your life that is ongoing. Where are the flames really hot in your life right now? Maybe it's excruciating physical pain that you wake up with every day and you're just looking for some relief. Maybe it's a situation involving your child. Your child is a prodigal. Maybe it's your marriage. The person you share your bed with is your enemy. Or maybe you're not sharing a bed anymore. Or maybe, maybe you're like, man, I wish I even had an enemy to contend with because I'm just really, really lonely. Whatever it is, the flames are really hot and it doesn't feel like you're being delivered. Don't forget, but if not. Which brings us to our fourth point, the one worthy of our worship. Now, apparently, Nebuchadnezzar didn't find all of this but if not talk inspiring, moving, stirring. He just rages. So he has the young men bound and thrown into the fire. The fire is so hot that it kills those throwing them into the fire. And then what happens next? Verses 24 to 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He, declined, he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. There were three who went into the fire, and now there are four in the fire. Who's with them in the fire? Who's with you in the fire? Ultimately, this anticipates and casts our gaze forward to the one who came down, all the way down, into the fire. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He descended into the only fire, the only fire that can destroy you, the ultimate fire of God's judgment, hanging and dying on the cross to deliver you from it. The flames of all of the world's false worship consume him in order to deliver you from its temptation and its power to bring you to true worship of the only one who is worthy of your worship. Threats from idols, I-D-O-L, are idol, I-D-L-E, and have no power over you who believe and belong to the one before whom one day every knee will bow. They have no power. They have no authority. They have no claim over you because he has vanquished them all, and he alone reigns. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus, who is with you in the fire. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Do not fear them, but fear him 
who can destroy both soul and body in hell. For you who trust in Jesus, when you're in the fire and it's really hot, he's with you and he is for you. He delivers you in the fire and through the fire all the way. And you come out unsinged, not even smelling smoke. As it says in Romans 8, in all these things, not around them, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. In the fire, in the fire, and through the fire, you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you. In, in Christ, for those of you who are in Christ, and everyone is called to be in Christ, everyone is invited to come to Christ. In Christ, the fire is not the place of your destruction, but the place of your deliverance of your sanctification, of your holiness, of your radiance, of your brilliance, of your beauty, of your being refined into the image of Jesus Christ himself. The fire is the place where you find out that his love is stronger than death and better than life and overcomes the world. Does that truth reside in your soul? So this is from the hymn, How Firm a Foundation which is based, uh, this verse is based on Isaiah 43, verse 2. When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, uh, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not harm you, I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are brought out of the fire and they are untouched. They do not even smell of smoke. So seeing that he's in fact not God, Nebuchadnezzar confesses. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, verses 28 to 30. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks against anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So obviously we can just sort of, you know, Nebuchadnezzar declares that, you know, their people's lives will be ruined, their houses turn to rubble. That's just his way of doing things, I guess, his modus operandi. But significantly, what does he say? No other God is able to rescue in this way. Now, I don't know what Nebuchadnezzar meant, and certainly he didn't have an understanding of the gospel, but he's right. No other God can rescue in this way, for there is no other God who can rescue. And this is the one who rescues in the fire with you to save you through the fire. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. Now, it's important to realize, if they had given in, there would have been no such confession from the mouth of this king giving glory to God. It is only because they didn't bow as demanded, even under intense pressure, but worshipped him who alone is worthy of worship, that this unbelieving king acknowledged that God is God and he is not. What they simply did was trust in the Lord. When you trust in the Lord, the outcome belongs to him. You simply put one foot, step of faith, take one step of faith in front of the other. And who knows how he will manifest his glory in a way that's even surprising to you because he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. So that even the most powerful man in the world gives him glory. Even if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, the Lord can move mountains. So let your life so shine before others that they see your good deeds and praise your Father, glorify your Father who is in heaven. Worshiping and obeying God is a good deed. Resisting idols is a good deed that glorifies God. So, brothers and sisters, May we so bear witness in this time and place the Lord has granted us to live by faith in him. 
Our God is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us. But if not, we will only worship him who is worthy. Let's pray. Lord, we seal this time together now with a prayer for the power of your Spirit to seal this word to the hearts of all who have heard it. Lord, I pray that the devil would not come and steal your word, um, that we would go from here as if we haven't heard anything. I pray that the cares of this life and the desire for other things would not choke your word. But this word from you, Lord, written for our instruction and our holiness, would find fertile, soft, receptive hearts to live and to grow up unto eternal life. I pray, Lord, that there would be, that there would be discernment to identify the idols that are being worshipped. I pray, Lord, that where there is temptation to believe that there is no one to deliver, that you cannot deliver, that your deliverance would be trusted in. I pray that where the flames are hot and threatening, that the fellowship and the power of your presence, Lord Jesus, would be bringing deliverance and a knowledge of your love and faithfulness and refining and making us more like you. And we pray, Lord, as a result of our faithful witness, that you would be magnified, that you would be glorified, so that even those who are in positions of power, <laughs> seats of authority in this world, would say that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These, th these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus, in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.